This is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We help people to make space for what matters and get more done. And we partner with some of the world's leading companies who share our mission to transform the world of work. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Sarah Ockwell-Smith. Sarah is one of the world's leading parenting experts, having written 13 books and sold half a million copies. Her philosophy of gentle parenting is hugely influential in the motherhood WhatsApp groups of Great Britain. And her latest book, How to Be a Calm Parent, has as much to tell us about how to look after ourselves as it does how to look after our kids. In this episode, we talk about how to be calm, self-kindness, the peaceful Pentagon, and why being a busy parent isn't actually something to be proud of. This is Sarah Ockwell Smith. There we go. We're rolling. I'm with Sarah Ockwell Smith. How are you? Good, thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's um, really nice to talk to you. And um, I read on your bio that you've written 13 books about parenting. So I, have, I suppose yeah. <laughs> I'm just sort of coming up to the end of my sixth book right now. And um, I'm like I'm constantly telling myself it's my last one. Mm-hmm. So Same here. Is that, is that something you've told yourself every book for the last 12 books? So, well, I mean, last year I wrote two. So I've got two out this year, like one next week and one in about four months time. And I've I've made a vow to myself that I'm not writing another one this year. So I've, I've stick, I'm sticking to it so far. I just really would like a year off. Of, I like writing, but I haven't actually had a year off writing since 2011. So Wow. We'll see if so I stick to it. So you've written a book a year since 2011? One or two a year since 2011, wow. yeah. <laughs> and what's your secret to being able to produce at that volume? Because, you know, I find it, I mean, juggling it, I have I have one kid and I co-parent. So, you know, in many ways I have half a kid. Um, and uh, yeah, and I just find the struggle of fitting that in alongside everything else. Um, is really real so like what's your secret to um to to keeping on schedule um I don't really have one you know I'm my kids are older so they're between 14 and 20 so they're much more self-sufficient at that age so I, I mostly work when they're at school or college or something like that um I just do less of other stuff like a day I rarely do housework and stuff like that you know there there is no secret is there if you work really hard at one thing then you have to do less of something else so for me, it's less housework. I've got like a, I'm literally sitting in my kitchen at the moment and I can see I've got a mountain of washing on the floor that hasn't been done. So I was going to say less housework is either involves mess or a good cleaner. Yeah. But I, you know, I'm too, I mean, I don't need to talk about it later. I'm such a perfectionist. I can't have a cleaner because right, okay. not in that I don't like the work that they do, but because I <laughs> really insane I don't know if anybody else is the same but I have to clean before they come so it actually makes me more stressed I've tried you know I have one for about six months and it made me so stressed that on the morning the cleaner was due I had to get up and clean everything so that she wouldn't see everything dirty I suppose it's good to have a deadline so the thing for me is um when I go away for a weekend because I live in Brighton and it's a nice place to be I put my place on Airbnb and one of the big benefits of it being on Airbnb is that it it's my deadline to sort of make the decisions about clutter and move stuff out. So it kind of really forces me to be more minimalist, knowing that I've got this deadline of it all having to be spick and span on um, yeah, certain gosh, days. no, I couldn't do that. <laughs> um, so the book we're going to talk about is um, How to Be a Calm Parent, which, I mean, I read the title and I thought, yes, please, that's definitely something that I need. Um, but like, just before we get into the book, um, I mean, everybody's had a really difficult last couple of years. But at the start of the book, you tell your story of of the last couple of years. Um, and it sounds like you've, you know, you've had a few more challenges than most over the last few years. Do you want to just talk us, um, talk us through that? Yeah. So, I mean, people have been asking me to write this book for a good decade now. And I would always say, I don't think I can write that. I don't think I can do it justice because I'm really not calm. 
um, I have huge anger issues and I just really felt that it would be really inauthentic for me to write it and actually to be honest I didn't know what to put in it either so in all of my books there's been like a little chapter that talks about being calm and self-care and actually it's not what you do or say to your children it's how you are that makes the difference so there's always been a little bit about it and I've always known that I needed to get better at it um, and then it kind of became the book that needed to be written like everybody was saying to me, my publishers were saying to me oh let's do a book about this so I kind of thought all right I'm going to do this and then sort of corresponded with um, for me I um, was diagnosed with cancer and the COVID lockdown hit all at the same time and my yeah. default mechanism for coping with stress is to be more busy so I have a, class a classic um, kind of freeze and fawn stress style so I people please and I get really busy to sort of be sticking my head in the sand and ignoring things by being more busy and I basically couldn't do that anymore um, I had to slow down because you know, I had to have surgery and stuff but and then after that happened I actually ended up working sort of the very next day because Covid hadn't quite hit then you know there were rumbles about it but we weren't in lockdown but then full lockdown happened and I had to basically think all right I actually need some time to recover now and I need to for me I felt like I had to recover I'm not really a very spiritual person but spiritually is the best word to fit here mm. like emotionally and spiritually as well as physically and I was really forced to do that because everything was shut and I couldn't go and run off and run workshops and do talks and do whatever else I would have ordinarily done so in some ways the book is sort of oddly autobiographical in that it's pretty much the journey that I went on to learn how to be calm and deal with my demons and it it kind of it grew from there so it's like a really personal book for me um, in that I talk about all my flaws and the process that I went through but it feels the most authentic and the most real for me because it's something that I really have experienced and I really do genuinely feel that I've changed as a result of it. How would you describe that uh, sort of period where the the kind of shock hit where you did have to stop and then you're just sat there with your own thoughts and you you no longer have that busyness that I think so many people are addicted to aren't they? Um, how would you describe that sort of initial shock and, and what did you learn about yourself? Um, terrifying, to be honest. Um, one thing I think I have learned is one of my children has ADHD and I'm almost certain that I have it as well. Um, I really sort of, I struggle hugely with the sort of getting started with things and the procrastination side, but I really struggle with having nothing to do. And it was just not being anywhere, not talking to anybody. I just didn't know what to do with the time. And I find, I still, do, well, less so now, but I find it more stressful to relax and do nothing than I do to be really busy. I think of my whole life, I've kind of thrived on living on cortisol and yeah, yeah. constantly keeping on going. But no, the, the doing less was awful from a, like from a movement perspective, being confined to the house, but from a, the fact that I couldn't be busy and I couldn't escape what was happening in my mind as well. And so... In terms of how that's changed your parenting, so slowing down and, um, you know, and, and really sort of taking that time, have you noticed changes in terms of your own parenting and, and what's been different? So I think I took time to really understand myself and where I came from. It sounds silly, but we spend sort of so much time growing up and moving on to the next thing and the next. We, we don't really spend time retrospectively looking back at our past and thinking was that healthy for me you know how did it affect me we just keep on pushing forwards so it gave me a long time to look backwards um, and what I really learned as well is that when I do less I'm actually a much better person yeah. but I have this almost I don't know self-sabotaging mechanism that if I'm not busy I feel that I need to do something and I'm a chronic people pleaser uh, which again I know is very much linked to my upbringing but if somebody is asking for help with something I'm right in there volunteering or I was but I think the biggest thing that I learned from the whole slowing down thing was to say no a lot more to other people to have those boundaries to say no I'm really sorry I can't help and to not jump in and volunteer and that that has made the hugest difference to my peace of mind but to my parenting as well because I'm not constantly busy in trying to do something else I've got more time for my kids but more importantly more time for me to be re more relaxed and calmer and I don't get it right all the time 
you know, I always thought I should have called the book How to Be a Calmer Parent, not to be a calm parent, because, you know, nobody's calm all the time, but I'm definitely a lot better. And obviously that reflects in your kids as well. So let's talk a bit about the book. So How to Be a Calm Parent. And you've got these seven principles of being a calm parent or a calmer parent. And the first one is everybody can be a calmer parent. Yeah, so the amount of parents I meet who believe that you're either calm or you're not, they they kind of view calmness as a fixed trait. So they'll look and think, well, other people are calm. I'm not calm. It's kind of not worth me trying. It's very much, I'm sure you talk about fixed and growth mindset. So they're very much in the fixed mindset of calmness is something you have or you don't have. And if they don't have it, then it's not really worth trying. You know, that's not how they were born. But I really and truly don't believe that's true. I believe that everybody can be calmer. There's obviously things that are getting our way. So what's happening in their life at the moment, depending on sort of certain amounts of privilege you have and whatever. We can't all be like uber zen calm gurus, but we can definitely improve on where we are at the moment. And um, what I love is that the second one that follows it up is everybody loses it at times. Yeah. And <laughs> I think it's really hard for me and I never gave myself the term a parenting expert and I actually really hate that term. I think what I am is more an expert in kind of taking the research and the knowledge and translating it into something that's easier for parents to understand. But because I have this term and this label, people seem to think that I'm like really perfect. And I think that's really scary. If you've got somebody giving you parenting information or advice and you think that they've got their can I swear on here? Yeah, <laughs> so if you yeah. think they've got their shit together all of the time. Yeah. And that's just not true. Every single person, including me, absolutely loses their shit many, many times. You know, maybe not weekly. Maybe I did lose it weekly. Maybe I'm now onto monthly now or fortnightly. But even me as a, an expert, absolutely everybody, it doesn't matter how calm you think they are, how together they are, everybody goes through periods where they are really struggling with being in control and calm with their kids is it like almost it must be like doubly stressful for you you know if you do lose your shit it's like the people around you who know you are like yeah, yeah but you're the one that writes the books about it <laughs> no, did... it must almost make it harder for that even to be allowed to happen thankfully i'm not at the stage that, that happens in public anymore because my kids are older <laughs> right. so like yeah, if yeah. i had toddlers that would have been much harder um yeah but it will obviously it will happen behind closed doors now and the worst thing that happens is one of my kids will inevitably say, I thought you were a parenting expert. You're meant to know what you're talking about. You're yeah. not meant to shout at us in your book or in your video. You say that this is really bad. So yeah, I think that's the worst that I get. And maybe my next door neighbor hearing me shouting. Yeah. I mean, why had I not thought of that? That's the most obvious thing, isn't it? That like the people who are going to most use that against you are going to be your own kids. Mm -hmm. right? like, Absolutely. If they're teenage kids. Yeah. I really love like those principles and like, um, uh the uh the idea that messing up doesn't undo all the good was a really good one for me and it feels like that is something that is you know equally applicable to sort of any self-development and, and you know and, and how we're growing in our jobs so just tell us about your experiences of that so this this idea that you know when, when we screw stuff up it doesn't actually undo all the good work that we've done before. We have such a defeatist attitude, don't we? It's like if you've eaten really healthily for the whole month and you have a donut, we automatically leap into thinking, oh, that's it, I've undone it all now. I may as well sort of binge and have another one. There's no going back, which is insane. You know, it hasn't undone all of the nourishment that you've put in your body in 30 days previous in just the same way if you've kind of really nailed being calm with your kids for a month and then you have a hideous shouting episode it's not going to undo what you've done you know children are really resilient and i think the one thing that more parents should understand is it is actually really important that we mess up and that we lose our temper and we yell and whatever because if we don't our kind of the, the perfect parenting air that we portray is actually terrifying for our children. We end up raising them with perfectionist tendencies, which is never a good thing for anybody. It just makes us seem unobtainable and like mm. they can't share their emotions yeah. with us. But the most important thing is when we mess up, it allows us to make things right again. So the psychologists call this the rupture and repair cycle. In the book, I call it the holler and heal cycle. So when you've screamed or yelled or you've done something, you absolutely can repair it. What you need to do is to apologize to your child and make things right. 
But that's really hard because most of us were raised as children never being on the receiving end of an apology from an adult. You know, when I speak to Mm. parents and say, do you remember your parents, a teacher, somebody who had authority over you apologizing to you and admitting they were wrong? And most people really can't. You know, we were raised with a do as I say, not do as I do. Adult is always right. Adult should be respected. So it's quite a hard thing for us to say, I'm really sorry that that was nothing about you that was about me I shouldn't have yelled I shouldn't have shouted I shouldn't have given you that silly punishment I was wrong um how can I make it right to you and when we do that it's so important because it helps the connection we have with our children it helps them to be real and authentic with their emotions around us but also it really helps them as they grow to know how to make things right, whether it's with their own children, whether it's with a work relationship, whether it's with friends, you know, or a romantic relationship, it helps them to know how to resolve conflict. And so many children grow up not knowing how to, they just go and retreat into themselves and shut themselves away in a room and don't share how they're feeling. So we must look on the times that we screw up as actually maybe the most important times of parenting. And I suppose, You know, the idea of apologising and the word sorry is always vulnerable, isn't it? Yeah. Do you have any any thoughts for people on, you know, sort of how to how to lean into that vulnerability? Because it just it feels really uncomfortable. To be honest, all of this work is vulnerable because it all relates back to how we were raised and feelings that we've not dealt with. And it's really difficult work. And I think just acknowledging that is really important. Apologising will feel really alien to you when you first do it and it's a bit like, think of it like a muscle. So when you start working out, it's really, really hard, but you practice it more and it will get easier. And your apology doesn't have to be perfect either, you know, (laughs) just even attempting to apologise is helpful. But you have to kind of take the pressure off yourself and think you're learning, you're going to make mistakes when you apologise as well as apologising for your mistakes and that's okay. Just kind of, I think in general, everything that I talk about is just being kinder to yourself, lowering the expectations of yourself and understanding it's okay to mess up as long as you pick yourself up and keep trying. Yeah, absolutely. Um, So I'm writing a book on kindness at the moment and so I was really interested to see your chapter on self-kindness, which I agree with you is just hugely important. And you've got this concept of uh, the peaceful pentagon in there do you want to talk about the peaceful pentagon because i think sometimes people have a sense that they need more self-care which is like a really awful word isn't it often it, it sort of it's so loaded and you know people want to be kinder to themselves but then often it's like okay where do i start what do i do Um, And I think you break it down really nicely with this idea of the peaceful pentagon. So, yeah, tell us about that. I mean, I think the term self-care is really damaging to start with. Um, It implies that if we're struggling, it's our fault because we've not done self-care enough. It implies that we have to do more. And when you're a tired parent, you know, particularly if you've got a younger child and you've had no sleep and someone's saying you need to do more breathing exercises or you need to go to a yoga class or something, it's just too much. It's more stuff that we have to do. You know, we... We're always trying to solve problems by doing more. But then on the other hand, if you do the self-care and it doesn't work, then you're often left thinking, well, I've tried self-care and I still feel terrible. It must be me. So I think avoiding, it's also become such a buzz term, hasn't it? You know, so many companies use it to advertise products now, particularly yeah, aimed at mums. Yeah. Um, there's like whole yeah. ad schemes aimed at mums doing self-care. So I kind of sort of throw that term out the window and say, look, It's a whole journey. There are so many things involved in becoming karma. One of the things to do is to just be kinder to yourself. And that doesn't involve any form of paying for massages or lavender bubble baths or anything like that. It's basically just realizing that you're a person and you're doing your best and just, you know, treat yourself with the same kindness you would your children or other people. But alongside the self-kindness, which is, it's really, it doesn't take time. It doesn't take money. It's just about having conversations in your head. But I think we also can't avoid the fact that there are other things that, you know, kind of basic lifestyle hygiene almost that makes a difference. So the peaceful Pentagon is that um, there are five specific things that I think are really important is like the groundwork or the scaffolding that we have to get in place before we sort of really improving things with self-kindness, which are 
just really simply eating well and I don't mean like nutrition advice eating well there's no nutrition advice in it at all I talk about sort of intuitively eating so it's trying to avoid like kind of like the diet mindset and just eating when you feel hungry if you want something with sugar go eat something with sugar don't sort of punish yourself self with your eating um things like being mindful if you're deficient in anything obviously you know if you're deficient in magnesium or uh, b6 or something that will maybe affect how you think and feel so just really basic are you eating what you need to do and are you eating mindfully sleeping well which is such a huge one particularly when you have young children who don't sleep um but mm, yeah one of the things i talk about is when we do have young children who don't sleep we're quite obsessed with their bedtime routines and what their bedroom is like and we buy all of these products to help them sleep but then what we completely forget is our own sleep so we'll have done a nice one hour long bedtime routine with perfect lighting and smells and reading a storybook and then we'll just collapse in a heap in bed with our phone and and do nothing to help ourselves so applying that same basic sleep hygiene rules and having a bit of a bedtime routine and prioritizing relaxation and sleep is really important you also said as part of that um try and only have one pillow which yeah. i just thought was really interesting <laughs> just like really some bizarre random tips but yeah if you have two pillows it lifts up your head and neck in such a way that it kind of cricks it and is uncomfortable but also can impact on your breathing and your oxygen intake but yeah, I mean, we're not so, meant to so sleep with pillows. So reduce your pillows down to like the most Just you know, minimal that you can get away with. Yeah. Pretty much. If you think, yeah. we're, we're kind of meant to sleep flat, aren't we? But there's so much we do in like modern life today, sleep-wise, that screws up sleep, whether it's ours or our children. Um, and then, so we've got resting well, which is just sort of taking time to relax, which isn't self-care because self-care is doing something, but just time to just chill out and do nothing or do something you enjoy. Um, moving well, so it's basically talking about exercise. And what was really interesting is there's some research that came out um, just after, I think it was the first COVID lockdown that looked at new parents and their stress levels. And what they found is they went into it thinking, you know, new parents really stress what's going to improve their stress levels and their mental health. Surely it's gotta be more sleep because that's what every new parent wants, isn't it, is more sleep. Um, and they compared it with new parents who maybe still weren't getting enough sleep, but they got more exercise. And they found that the impact of the exercise was significantly better than the impact of more sleep. So in other words, having less sleep, but doing more exercise leaves parents feeling less stressed and more relaxed. And I always, you know, I have such a, a love, or mostly a hate-hate relationship actually with exercise, because it's. I think it's something that... <laughs> When we were younger, we all used to love moving our bodies, didn't we? As young children, we'd jump and skip and run. And like the worst thing you can imagine when you were five was keeping still. But then we start school and it becomes another lesson. Like we have a PE lesson and it's not about moving freely anymore. It's about moving in this way in this lesson and this way in this lesson. And then they start teaching you about healthy living and the importance of exercise. And then it becomes another kind of chore and we lose the joy of moving because it feels good and if you weren't very good at exercise or sports or PE at school then you can very much fall into that again that fixed mindset of well you know what this exercise thing isn't for me it's for people who are naturally good at it or something which is definitely not I, what I was in you know I was hopeless at sports at secondary school so as soon as I left that was it I didn't do exercise anymore and then obviously I, I felt that I needed to and over the years I've tried like yoga and Tai Chi and Pilates and nothing was ever quite right for me like I'd be in my Pilates class still being anxious about something and then um, it, again this is partly because of the cancer diagnosis um, if you do exercise I think three times a week for 150 minutes it reduces the risk of recurrence by like 50 or 60 percent something massive so I was like, okay, I need to do some more exercise, but this time it needs to be fast paced. So I found CrossFit, which is something that I thought I would absolutely hate. But I go into this, like I'm probably the oldest and the most unfit person there. And I go into the, they call it the CrossFit box. And there's, um, it's like really loud rock music or dance music. And I literally sort of throw things around or like lift heavy weights and grunt a lot. And I really love it. Like I'm so <laughs> bad at it, but and I'm still really unfit, but then I've got all of these muscles and I feel really strong and it's just really fun. Mm. And I think what I found is that fun that I had when I was five 
that same you know being a, it's just so different when you find something that clicks for you and it's not a chore you do it because you enjoy it and the difference it makes like I'll wake up in the morning and think I really don't want to exercise like I've really hurt everywhere I ache I'm tired I want to just roll over and go back to sleep but then I go and I come back kind of buzzing which is really nice and the last one out of the five is spending time in nature which I'm if you believe in astrology I'm a Taurus so I'm an earth sign and I really for me getting out in nature and touching the earth whether you sort of talk about grounding or whatever is really important like I've never worn shoes outside I'll always walk outside on the earth barefooted um, for me sort of over COVID and recuperating I got a little greenhouse and that was just my sanctuary I love getting mm. my hands in all the soil and like I'll end up with it everywhere and a big mess and growing seeds and stuff but just spending time in nature is so important and again sort of if you look at the research into shirinyoku which is the Japanese art of forest bathing there's so much research that shows when we spend time particularly in forests they lower our stress levels and there's um, chemicals given off by the trees that actually have a really direct impact on our body physiology so when my kids were younger when it was really tough at home with them the my kind of like the mantra was if in doubt go out like bundle them all up and just get outside somewhere and I think we could kind of embrace more of that as adults yeah for sure and I mean you know that just feels like such a good list of five things that anybody listening to this can just think about which one of these do I need a bit more of you know eating well sleeping well moving resting and getting out in nature I mean just like there's all of us need all of those things and all of us probably have one that we're neglecting a little bit or could do a little bit more of. and they're so simple like it's not rocket science is it i think we all know this but i think they tend to be the first things that we neglect when we're busy the other thing you could talk about in self-kindness is the idea of self-talk and there's a really nice little bit where you sort of give some bullet points and say these are the kind of phrases that i'd want my kids to be saying about themselves and then like flipping that around and saying, well, actually, do we say that about ourselves? One of them is, um, I am worthy of love. Yeah, you know, if you, we all want to raise children to be happy and confident and have great self-esteem. And honestly, the amount of questions I get from parents are around that top topic, sort of how do I help my child with their self-esteem? How do I get them to just feel better about themselves? And again, it's not about there are so many things you can buy in our sort of like flashcards and colouring in books and storybooks for kids designed around improving their self-esteem and their motivation and confidence. And I think we've got it completely wrong if we go down that route. And this is just a sort of a classic example where it really does come back to us. If we are full of self-hatred and self-loathing and we don't have much confidence and esteem from ourselves, it doesn't matter how many flashcards or colouring books or books we buy our children or courses that we put them on or whatever, they are basically going to learn about how to feel about themselves based on how we feel about ourselves. And if we want our kids to think I'm worthy of love, we have to think that about ourselves too. We can't raise them to be different from us. And I suppose that sort of leads us on to maybe talking about guilt. And you've got this whole chapter which just fits really well into just everything I like to talk about on Beyond Busy. So why we should stop having it all. When you have children, basically you feel guilty about everything, don't you? You think, I should be happier so that my children would be happier. But if being happier involves being away from them or I don't know, diverting time or money from them, then we feel guilty. So we can't win there. Um, and one of the things I talk a lot about in the book is for working parents and the, the hideous guilt that accompanies that, that you just, I think you, you just, whatever you do, if you stay at home, you feel guilty about that because you're not earning money and maybe you're not, well, you think you're not showing a good impression to your children. But then if you go to work, then you're also thinking, well, I'm not spending enough time with my children. and I'm missing important things. And I think it's something that's much more, most of the book applies to both men and women. But I think this is one that's really key for working mothers or stay at home mothers. I think we're still not on a par with men, with how society thinks about us, whether we're working or whether we're staying at home mothering wise. You know, mothering is really undervalued. Stay at home mums are really seen by our society as lazy and sort of um, trying to get all the benefits and not working, not contributing to the society. But then when we go out to work, 
we're seen as too ambitious or maybe a bit negligent or, you know, too focused on the money. And then in the meantime, you've maybe got a career that you've worked really hard for that you want to achieve, but you've then got the pull of, but if I do that, I'll see less of my children. And then you sort of your career aspirations start crumbling and then you become unfulfilled and your confidence is low. And we end up with this kind of really horrible, vicious circle of we can't win no matter what we do. And I think there is no answer to that, whether you're um, a mum or a dad, there is zero answer. Whatever you do, whether you work, whether you don't work, whether you're busy, whether you're not busy, you will always feel guilty. And guilt is just a part of our life. And I think that I, I don't know what the answer is. You know, I say in the book, maybe it's not the best thing to say in the book, but, you know, particularly when we're talking about working parents, there is no answer. What we need is such a seismic shift in our society with the way that we view work and parents, which I think maybe a little bit has started to happen because of COVID and the flexible working, but just in the way that everything in our culture is set up, we can't change things in this generation, I don't think. So we have to live with the guilt. And I think maybe we need to just be a little bit more comfortable living with the guilt and realize that everybody has it. We're never not going to have it. And actually, I think it also means we are a good parent because if we're feeling guilty and we're worried it already shows how much we care yeah i suppose guilt is a, is a sign that you care right i mean i love that bit there's a bit at the start of that chapter where i think it's like someone else is talking to you and they say the trouble with being a working mum is that you're supposed to work like you don't have kids and you're supposed to parent like you don't have a job and just the expectation of that is is frightening but then also you like presumably anyone who's a working parent cares about their job and also cares about wanting to do a good job you know back at home with their kids too right yeah so you've got two full-time jobs that you're trying to fit into one full-time job and it will never happen for anybody will it you know it doesn't even matter if you're super rich and you've got nannies and cooks and cleaners and chefs because you still it's time that we're lacking and we yeah i'm we just have to i think we have to just it comes back to being kinder to ourselves and understand there is no answer there is no perfect there is i talk in the the book about something called the nirvana fantasy with this idea that we're often so mean to ourselves because we think that there is a perfect solution to something there is a perfect answer the world is very black and white but there isn't a nirvana it's all the mucky shades of grey in between. And whilst we perceive that there's this nirvana, we will always feel that we're not quite living up to it, that we've not nailed it, that we've not got it right. But it doesn't exist, yet we still pursue it. And while we're pursuing it, we're still full of all this guilt and stress. And we have to just let the idea go that there's some perfect solution, perfect life balance or work-home balance, because there isn't. Have you come across anything that's worked for you to just help you let go of that idea and helped you to let go of guilt? I think just observing and listening to your children rather than observing and listening to your own thoughts and realizing actually I've created pretty cool kids who are pretty happy here. I've done a good job and you know for me when my children were much younger and I was out all weekend doing, I don't know, workshops or talks or something like that. And I get home and I'd spent all weekend thinking that I'd ruined their life, that I was away from them in these formative years. And I'd get home and find out that they'd had a wonderful weekend and they were really happy. And the nicest thing actually for me was when they stopped really missing me. It sounds silly that I come home and I wouldn't have them running to the door anymore. They'd be like, oh, hi, mum. And that, yeah, just realising that actually, man, you've raised pretty good kids. I'm pretty sure they're well adjusted. Look how happy they are. And step out of your own thoughts into reality. So mine's eight, so I'm nowhere near that uh, stage yet. But I can imagine the first time you realise that they don't miss you that much, it must be a bit of a wound to the ego. And then like, yeah, so much. after a while, you can sort of rationalise it as, oh, this is a, this is a good thing. Yeah, you're you're right on the kind of the transition at eight, aren't you? Of like the I call it little parenting and big parenting. So you're kind of the little parenting here and the big parenting here, and the children themselves don't know whether they want to be big or be little, and it's a real time of change for everybody. It is funny sometimes you look at them as, uh, you know, eight year olds. You can look at an eight year old as being one day you can sort of just turn around and look at them and and you see a child, and then the next day you sort of turn around and it's like. 
you're a, a little grown up man, you know, just like sitting at the table eating your fish fingers or whatever. You're, you're a little, little grown up man. Yeah. We spend like the first sort of seven to eight years and it's so claustrophobic being a parent because they need you all the time and they need you so much. And you basically spend that time thinking, I'd actually like a bit more time to myself. And then you become accustomed to it. You kind of deal with it and live with it. And then as soon as that happens, as soon as you've kind of got happy with the, the transition to parent to fatherhood, motherhood, then they grow up and they start to break away from you. And it's like, oh, my goodness, I have to detach now. You know, I've spent all this time growing roots, but now I need to give them wings. And it's I've always said, you know, I think it's much harder to then detach and give them wings than it is to grow the roots. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. Parenting it's in the nice tween and teen years is interesting. Roots and wings. Um, well, this podcast is called Beyond Busy, and busyness is um, obviously a constant theme. So I should probably say congratulations on being awarded Britain's Busiest <laughs> Mum 2012. Yeah. That was... um, tell us how that came about. So um, I won't name names because I think it was well meant. So it was basically a, a bit of a PR campaign that what I've realised since working in the parenting industry and it absolutely is an industry is that most people in the PR companies and the ad agencies marketing companies are all young people with no children and somebody there <laughs> had thought it would be a great idea to publicize um, this mobile phone web network you know an international mobile phone network to come up with this idea of let's award Britain's busiest mum and let's tie it with the release of a brand new phone um, and we can show how this phone and our Wi-Fi makes life much easier for her to multitask on the go when she's juggling. And it's it seemed like a good idea, doesn't it? Like if you're a 21-year-old a, a fresh out of uni with no responsibilities. So I entered it because, you know, why not? I thought I am pretty busy. Um, the prize was a makeover in a, in a, in a really big, glossy UK magazine. Uh, a Caribbean holiday and a phone. And I'm like, okay, that sounds really cool. And I am quite busy uh, at the time. So I have four children who at that time were between like four and nine, I think. And I was on the PTA, the Parent Teacher Association of our school and our preschool. And I was writing books. So had a career as an author. I also was a co-director of a company. I just set up training others for um, parenting lessons. And I was also working as an antenatal teacher, teaching pregnant couples how to have babies and a doula. Like I would actually go to the birth and hold people's hands and catch vomit and stuff. So I had a lot on my plate and I thought, okay, well, I think I'm quite busy. So I entered and then I won, which was quite shocking. And I got traipsed into London and I had hair and makeup and a photo shoot, um, won my prize, which was really lovely. And I felt quite proud at the time because again, I think this almost comes back to being a woman when you're a mum, seeing, being seen as kind of busy and contributing to the economy and raising children. It's almost like society thinks that, I don't know, like you're more worthy the more you do. Um, I'd had a really um, kind of high flying career in the pharmaceutical industry that I gave up when I had my first child and I'd been a stay at home mum for five years and that really dented my confidence because I found that people didn't want to talk to me because I was boring because I just raised kids. So I was really proud at the time of like, yeah, look at me, I've got four kids, I've got four jobs, I've written two books and how wonderful it is that like finally uh, people are noticing that I am contributing. And I look back now and, and I say in the book, at the same time, I kept going to my GP because I was just really tired and almost crying on my GP and saying, what's wrong with me? Why am I so tired? And I had so many blood tests and the GP was like, it's not, it's nothing physical. You know, you're just a bit stressed. Maybe you're doing a bit too much. And I was in such a mess, like this magazine I look all glossy and primped and preened with all my makeup on my hair but I would go like a week without brushing my hair and just putting it back in a ponytail and it would be like a mat of like tangled bird's nest hair and I would my kids would look beautiful in designer clothes and I'd be just looking a mess feeling a mess and it was hideous you know if I could change one thing about parenting now if I could turn back time it would be to do significantly less, like drop all the balls and just do one really well. But it was, I think now, such a damaging piece of PR and such a damaging contest that 
you know, let's find Britain's busiest mum. They may as well have just said, let's find Britain's most frazzled, most exhausted, most burnt out mum and reward her for pushing herself past the point of where nobody should ever be pushed. So, I mean, I think we still kind of talk about it. We don't do contests for it anymore, but we still reward busyness. And it's this idea that busyness is a badge of honour, right? And um, rather than seeing busyness as actually a very damaging uh, sort of symptom of how society is set up and the pressures that people face. And often the sign that people aren't coping, like I said with me, when I'm really stressed, I my default is to go to business, which comes back from when we were children and when we had big emotions and our parents or our teachers would distract us. That's essentially where it comes from. It's the distraction from feeling. So it's not healthy, is it? Whatever way you look at it. Distraction from feeling. I like that phrase. Um, there's a couple of things that you talk about in the book, um, in that chapter, in terms of how we can mitigate busyness or stop being so busy. Um, one of them, which I think is just, it's just great business advice as well as um, good personal advice is about saying no and trying to say no more often. So you mentioned there, if you could turn back time, what you do is, is try not to just juggle all the balls and just, you know, drop some of them and just do a few things well. And that involves a lot of saying no. So like, what are your, what are your tips on how to say no gracefully, how to make it okay? I think realize that saying yes doesn't make people like you more was a really big thing for me. So again, comes back from childhood. You know, I was always this good girl. I was obedient because I was praised for being good and doing what people asked of me. And that kind of stuck with my psyche as I grew up and my how I thought people liked me more if I was obedient and helped them and said yes. And I thought if I said no, that it would make them feel poorly of me. And I realized actually that really isn't true. Some of the people that I really admire say no lots and it doesn't change how people think about them so it's a bit of a mind shift and then yeah. what really helped me was having just a few stop phrases so i would chronic people please or i would just if somebody asked me to do something however busy i was i would just say yes because i was too embarrassed to say no but having it sounds so silly but i literally had a note saved on my laptop with three different ways that i could say no that i would literally copy and paste into like an email Something like, thank you so much for thinking of me. I'm at capacity right now. So it's saying, and actually, you know, there's this whole idea. I don't know who said it, but there's a phrase that no is a complete sentence. We don't have to say, no, this is why. We can just say no. That doesn't feel right to me. I, I'm too polite. But adding something like, you know, I'd love to. It sounds great. I just can't right now. Or I don't think this is me, but good luck. Yeah, but... No is a complete sentence is a, is a really sort of empowering thing though, isn't it? So even though you might then add one of your scripts and I want to hear what the other, the other two are as well, but like, even if you're going to add, no, I'm actually at capacity right now, just knowing that no would have been enough is almost, it's like, it feels to me like a so really much. empowering thought. Yeah. But, and the other, what are the other scripts that work? Thank you for thinking of me. The other one is like flattery saying, this sounds like such a great idea. I wish you the best of luck. Don't think it's right for me. Good luck. And the other one is having somewhere to refer people to that is free and doesn't involve anything from you. So if somebody emails me for advice, I would say, um, you know, I, unfortunately I can't help here, but here's an article on my website that might help, or here's a group that I find really helpful. You must get that loads, right? Like, so, because I suppose having written 13 books and you've written 13 books that are about parenting. And so, often when people are reading your books they're at a very transitional very stressful emotional time in their lives and your voice is guiding them through so you must get quite a lot of people sort of like reaching out to you and and sort of you know wanting advice wanting help um all that sort of thing Does, is that is that difficult to deal with? Is, is that overwhelming? So it's saying no, but having those boundaries put up in advance. So I would say I get maybe three or four emails every day asking for help. And I have put on my website on the contact page that they have to contact me through that I unfortunately, I don't give free advice just because simply the, the sheer amount of them. Um, some people ignore that and I think try anyway, but then I do say on my website in advance, please note if you do email at like this, you won't receive a reply. So right. I do just delete them. 
um, on right. Instagram, I get probably 50 to 100 messages every day. That's just on Instagram. Wow. Um, I've turned my messaging off on my Facebook page because that would be the same. So I, again, set boundaries. I do every normally Monday or Tuesday, I'll go on my stories and take live questions for a couple of hours. So um, I, I, I can't answer everybody even just to say no. I'd literally have to spend two hours every day just saying, sorry, I can't do this. So I do, again, I have to delete them. Yeah. It's difficult because... I work in a helping profession, you know, my whole work yeah. is helping people and I, I do really want to help people, but I just can't do it. And I also know that if I helped everybody, I'd have no time for myself, which means my children would suffer and actually I wouldn't be able to write the books or help people because I'd just be constantly ill. Yeah. And also there'd be no books. <laughs> yeah. I mean, man, I thought I got a lot of uh, emails from people asking for help sorting out their inboxes but yeah 100 messages a day that's like i'm starting to yeah i don't know what i mean what do you do with that i just i i can't sometimes i just literally just tick them all and bulk delete them because they make me stressed seeing them there. <laughs> i i don't know i think it's just the having the boundaries that look i'd love to help people i just can't here is this opportunity that i do every week and and when i do my live questions and answers i get probably get through about 20 or 30 questions and I reckon I get two to 300 submitted. So again, there's a lot that I ignore, but I just, I can't do more. But that's a good way of doing it, like batching up those questions and then, you know, you just hop on and be there live and, and be part of that. Um, the last thing I wanted to ask you about was, um, so you mentioned before about identity and you were saying that, you know, you had this career and then you ditched the career to become a, a, a working mom and, and start writing books um and there's a loss of identity there now your kids are in the teenage phase there's going to come a point in the not too distant future where you're no longer like you know really sort of connected to people who are just about to have their baby for the first time so is that something that you're thinking about are you worried about the sort of loss of identity once your kids fly the nest yeah i don't think worried i think if you look at the books I've written, there's a natural trajectory there. Like my first book was about babies then, it was about toddlers. So as my children grow, my books change. So my book before this one was about teenagers. So I wrote about 18, to, not 18, eight to 13 year olds. Next on my radio, when I do write one, which is not this year, will be about um, 13 to 21 year olds. And then at the back of my mind, I've got what I'd love to write one day is a book for first time grandparents. <laughs> but I want to be, a, you know, my eldest is, the same. my eldest is almost 20. So I'm hoping I've got 10 years before that one. But that's at the back of my mind. So, yeah, I kind of like it naturally grows. And then what I do now, sort of talking about parents' feelings, I, I, it doesn't matter if you're talking to somebody with a newborn or somebody with a, a 30 year old child. I think it applies to everyone, but yeah, no, I think it just naturally evolves, doesn't it? And you don't realise you've evolved until you look back and think, ah, oh, have actually really changed. Yeah, I interviewed a while ago. I interviewed Katie Thistleton, who's a DJ on Radio One, but she started life as a, a kids TV presenter on the broom cupboard on BBC, and then she went to Radio One, and now she's doing sort of like like study skills and documentaries and stuff, and so. She sort of in the same in the same way that you you know presumably you've got people who read your first like book about babies and they've kind of followed yeah, they through, grow the books up with through me. the years yeah and so Katie's had that as well where you know she had these eight year old kids that have then become ten and fifteen and you know and, and now they're sort of eighteen or whatever and you can see her sort of transitioning with that same audience into sort of like adult documentaries and you know sort of more sort of high highbrow content it's lovely i think people think that i've had a career plan and i really haven't like my whole career has been an accident or just happened naturally but it is it is really lovely to grow up with the people and even back to sort of in the early 2000s when i was teaching parents antenatal classes and being with their babies and those babies are now at university is yeah it's it's actually really nice i think to move with your audience yeah absolutely um and then I suppose, uh, I suppose my final question is like, just thinking about productivity within all of that. So it seems like you don't have a, seems like you're good at saying no, and you're pretty prolific. Have you got any, any tips or things that particularly work for you around like being productive and getting stuff done? I think I set times and I write so many notes to myself, like bullet point lists. 
I really love lists. Like I have lists everywhere. Um, and I mean everywhere. Sticking to a list and ticking it off. And then I just really like the thrill of like deleting it when it's done. That really helps me. But also I... I didn't, you know, I've been self-employed for 20 years now and I would work at every hour if there was work because, yeah, right. you know, you're scared of turning work away, aren't you? But now I really very much will only work mostly between like 9am and 3pm and having that time when I don't do anything in the evenings, I mean, I'd still be like on social media or something, but I won't deal with clients in the evening. That really helps to have that time away productivity is about doing less it really is yeah for sure um sarah thank you so much for being on beyond busy with us um so i'm i usually say to people where can they connect with you um and you can tell us where people can get you know connection and advice from you and where not to send it yeah not to send please no please no private messages um so yeah, I'm kind of like, this is, I probably need to take actually my own advice and do less, but I am on literally every social media platform, <laughs> just as my name. So Sarah Ockwell Smith, apart from Twitter, where I am the baby expert, which I hate. And it was a tongue in to tongue, tongue in cheek to choice about 10 years ago, but then I got verified <laughs> and you can't change your name when you're verified. Otherwise you lose your verified status. So otherwise you've got no blue ticket. I hate it, yeah. but so there, I am the baby expert and please know that I'm not being serious when I write that. Um, and just then just, yeah, literally every other social media platform is Sarah Ockwell Smith. Amazing. And the book is how to be a calm parent. And um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. This video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organizations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programs, and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You wanna sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you wanna buy some of my books? Or do you just wanna find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.